we have now begun the recording. All right. And I didn't introduce myself. My name is Aisha Shahida Simmons. I'm sorry, I just kind of jumped into all of the logistics and happy to be leading um, today's session. And so I just wanna invite everyone to just take a moment to connect. I'm aware that we are arriving from different time zones, West Coast. I know for a fact there's some West Coasters and definitely East Coasters. And often when we ar arrive anywhere, we're not always connected. The body and the mind are not connected. So I wanna invite you to arrive, to connect your mind with your body. And just take a few moments to do that. And if focusing on breath is not difficult for you, I should encourage you to just connect with your breath. Either through the nostrils, And if you have difficulty there, you can place your hand on your stomach or chest just to feel the in-breath and the out-breath, but to allow that to connect you, bring you here in this moment. I want to invite you to let go of three states of mind, judging mind, thinking, oh, I'm not doing this right, just to let go of that. Fixing mind, trying to fix something, just be in this moment to moment. Comparing mind, comparing what just happened or thinking that other people are focusing or grounded more than you are. So just open yourself to beginner's mind. If you haven't already, make sure that you are in a posture, either lying, standing, seated, that is comfortable, that allows you to be alert and attentive and also relaxed. If you are comfortable, I invite you to close your eyes or lower your gaze.
And while you are connecting with your breath, either through your nostrils, the in-breath, and the out-breath, and the sensation just above the upper lip, below the nostrils. Or the in-breath and out-breath in the chest or stomach. See if you can connect with those parts of your body that are touching the earth, be it your seat on your chair, which is touching the floor, which is connected to the earth, your feet, You're lying down, your back, just connecting with the earth. There's an awareness of gratitude or how the earth holds us through gravity. Thoughts are bound to come. They float along in our minds and we don't have to get caught up in them. We can view them like clouds passing in the sky.
staying connected with the breath. If you find yourself getting caught up in a story or thoughts, be gentle with yourself. Don't judge harshly. Just come back to the breath. Each time that you recognize that you're caught up in a thought is a moment of awareness. A moment of awakening. While staying connected to the breath, I want to offer a compassion meditation. These are very turbulent times. And frankly, they've been turbulent for a very long time. But just being in this moment, the awareness of the turbulent times, so much harm, violence, it's 
state-sanctioned violence, police violence, personal, intimate, partner violence, a lot of harm that we witness, that we may have experienced, a lot of suffering. It is a time that calls on us to be tender with ourselves and with each other. And so I will say a phrases that I invite you to say to yourself, <clears throat> to offer compassion to yourself and to others. Comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. So I will say it out loud and I invite you to say it silently to yourself, staying connected to your breath. I care about my suffering. I care for me. May I be free from all my pain. May I be happy. The next verse is for someone you know, you feel close to, and you care about directly. I care about your pain. I care for you. May you be free from all of your pain. May you be happy.
the next verse is for someone <clears throat> who you are indifferent to. You don't have a close relationship. You may see them on, they could be your male person or someone at the job, someone you see regularly on, if you ride public transit, drive Lyft driver. Someone who you don't have a connection with necessarily, but you are connected because we are all connected. I care about their suffering. I care for them. May they be free from all of their pain. May they be happy. Staying connected to the breath. This final verse. Is for all beings everywhere. Without exception. All beings. At some point on their journey suffer. And we are among the one in all beings. I care about our suffering. I care for us.
May we be free from all of our pain. May we be happy. We are held together by the universe. We are held together by the earth. We are held together by our ancestors. Thank you for your practice. <clears throat> so I want to invite everyone to take a let's see a five minute break. I have it's after it's seven minutes after the hour, wherever the hour is, whatever the hour is, wherever you are, to 
stretch or hydrate, bathroom break, or even do a little movement, mindful movement. And then we will come back and I will share about Reverend Dr. Leon Wright. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. I've got a, created a PowerPoint. Okay, let's start the, wait a minute. Sorry, I'm really, I'm very much an analog girl in a digital world. Um, let's start the presentation. Let's see, let's try this again. And then start presentation. All right. <clears throat> so I want to open my talk uh, with an excerpt from the June 2nd, 2022 Lions Roar published article, Making Offerings to Our Ancestors, authored by Osho Zinju Earthland Manual, a Black woman Zen priest elder um, who is the author of many, many books and is one of my mentors. And she wrote, and it comes actually um, from, I'll, I'll cite the book, I can't think of right this second, but the, this is an excerpt from her book, one of her recent books, she's very prolific. Quote, ancestors are everyone and everything that existed on the planet before your birth. Ancestors can include the earth, moon, sun, and stars. <clears throat> they can include the people in your blood lineage, loved or unloved. Included are those we want to disown because we feel they did not walk with integrity or were harmful to others. Their quote unquote wrongful actions have something to do with how we personally and collectively live and they too are ancestors. Ancestors are also people in the lineage of your spiritual practice and beings in the lineage of life itself. All spiritual and religious paths are ancestral. <clears throat> Buddhism is an ancestral practice in which the Buddha is the most revered ancestor. But even the Buddha knew himself to be in a stream of ancestors, also known as Buddhas. They were Buddhas before the one Buddha who is exalted today. That's close quote. And I thought it important to open with that quote from a um, Buddhist teacher um, because just to really set a context for why I'm called to pay um, homage and honor and lift up Reverend Dr. Leon Wright. Um, and the image that you see is a a bird, a Sankofa bird. Um, it's a mythical bird um, where you, his, the, the, the feet are kind of, the body's in the present, but it, the, it, and it's from West Africa, from Ghana, that you look back in order to move forward so that the, the past is always connected with the, the present and the future. So <clears throat> on, in late June 2020, shortly after I moved from Philadelphia, my hometown of 51 years, um, to Washington, D.C. to live with my partner, Sheila, I learned about Reverend Dr. Leon Wright from a Dharma friend, Joa McGee. Joa, who is the producer host of the podcast called Insight Myanmar, and I met sometime in spring 2008 at Damadara, the Vipassana Meditation Center in the Essen Goenka tradition in Shelburne Falls. 
We crossed paths again in January 2010 at Damagiri, <clears throat> which is um, Goenka's first Vipassana meditation center that he established in Igapuri, India in the 70s. Joa and I didn't communicate again until a decade later in summer 2020, during the wake of the uprisings in response to the murder of George Floyd. At that time, he was working with his producing partner on a special Insight Myanmar podcast series titled Dhamma and Race, and they invited me to be a co-producer of the series. It was in the context of many conversations that Joe and I had that he shared about the hidden figure in U.S. Buddhist history, Dr. Leon E. Wright. Dr. Wright was a Black scholar, theologian, author, and cultural attache. In the 1950s, he studied in Myanmar with Siaji Ubakin, a leading 20th century authority on and teacher of Vipassana meditation <clears throat> and the founder of the International Meditation Center in Yagun, Myanmar. My root teacher, and that's my first teacher in, in Buddhism, is Esen Goenka, who studied for 15 years with his beloved teacher, Siaji Ubakin. Later, Goenkaji, as his students affectionately called him, established over 400 Vipassana meditation centers around the globe. He undoubtedly had to have studied alongside Dr. Wright because they were there at the same time <clears throat> um, in, in, in Myanmar and at the International um, Meditation Center. Their paths had to have crossed. I only practiced Vipassana meditation within the Goenka tradition for 17 years, yet in all that time, I never heard about Dr. Wright. How was an African-American practitioner like myself never introduced to Wright's legacy within this tradition? I was stunned, confused, and intrigued. Joa shared a photocopied image of Dr. Wright and a link to a July, August, 1958 letter exchange between Dr. Wright and Siaji Ubakin, which is posted on the Pariyati website. Now, I just wanna share that Siaji, like Guruji, means revered teacher. So his name is Bakin. U is like Mr. Um, so but so I, I use the word Siaji Ubakin and just to honor Ubakin as a teacher. This is a picture of Goenkaji and I in, um, um, 2010, when I had the opportunity to go to India. And um, <clears throat> so over the years, I heard that going to G, oh, so I'm sorry, I'm skipping. I want to share some excerpts of um, the letter um, from going to G, I mean, from Dr. Wright to uh, uh, Uba King. And I want to share that I will, I've created a Google Doc that has links to all this information um, that the um, Elm Community Insight um, will send out if you're on their mailing list. If you're not on their mailing list, I invite you to join their mailing list. We have lots of activities happening. If you know me and have my email address, I can also send it to you. Um, if you're like, I can't join another listserv. I, um, but I need to say though, the mailings are very, very sporadic. They're, it's not an intense thing. And, have the opportunity to learn about uh, future events. Um, so in the letters um, from here, we see July 1958. So I want to just say what I found interesting on the Pariyati website is that it says Dr. Wright was an American. You can't really see it completely, but he was American working as a cultural attaché at the American embassy in, in Myanmar. Yes, Dr. Wright was an American, but if we if the word black or African American were just inserted there, I think that, I mean, I, I could have very easily have read um, these letters and had no idea that he was African American. So these subtle and inadvertent ways of, I mean, you know, of erasure in terms of just like, hey, I think that this is important um, to, to really lift up that this was a black man who was in Burma, who studied with Ubaikin. <clears throat> And so in the letter, uh, he, uh, Dr. Wright talks about how um, he shares his um, 
um, his his relationship with the Nietzsche. So he says, um, um, the simple fact remains, however, that I have failed to experience any separation from my Guruji and those closest to the meditation center since I've almost been continuously with a Nietzsche. For people who don't know, a Nietzsche is the Pali word, and the Pali is the original language of the Buddha, and a Nietzsche means impermanence. So he's saying, I've all been almost uh, continuously with a Nietzsche, continuously with awareness of impermanence. And as often as I have such an experience, I feel instinctively in your midst. Um, and so um, I'm just going to skip through. He says, I was sent to Burma. It was called Burma at that time um, before they um, gained, before it became Myanmar, before independence, the end of colonialization, um, for the primary purpose of meeting you and of knowing the power of a Nietzsche, knowing the power of impermanence for my life. I most deeply feel this to have been a destined encounter with a power which I, which will, I believe, prove itself indispensable to accomplishing the responsibilities of my life. Um, and then um, I wanted to uh, continue. And again, these are excerpts. I just took kind of screenshots. Um, and he talks, Dr. Wright says, if I brought something to the encounter, uh, in terms of Parmi, you gave it direction and most meaningful engagement in your inspirationally challenging and genuinely productive method. I shall be with a Nietzsche. I shall be with impermanence as long as I live and as often as I do. My spirit shall gratefully acknowledge the Guruji, the revered teacher who made it possible. Um, and so, and he says, Respect, respectfully yours and with continuing continuing gratitude. And then um, this is a picture of, of, of um, Ubaikin, Siaji Ubaikin. This um, to his, if you're, we're all facing the same way. On his, our left, which is his right, is Mother Sayamaji, who was the co, his co, a, a student, his senior despite, disciple and co-teacher of the um, International Meditation Center. And I, I want, and I thought this picture was really important in terms of also talking about women's leadership in 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 Dharma, um, and that Ubakin um, really recognized and uh, uh, cultivated the uh, the teaching of um, the training, I should say, of women to be teachers of the Dharma. So I, I just, you know, as much as this is about Dr. Wright, I also want to lift up Ubaikin in terms of I think he was just really ahead of his time as far as I'm concerned and very revolutionary in terms of just how he moved and so um, <clears throat> I continue I'm not going to go very deep into this letter I just want to I thought it was important to see how clearly Ubaikin was the, the senior teacher he's referring to Dr. Wright as my dear Dr. Wright at the end of the letter, you see with loving kindness that he doesn't even sign it, Siaji or U. He doesn't say Siaji U. He's calling himself, it'd be like saying Aisha Simmons. I'm not saying Ms. Aisha Simmons or teacher Aisha Simmons. So just in terms of that, even though he was the teacher, that just the kind of relationship, the mutual uh, respect and love. I mean, this, you, I can just feel the love, feel the metta in these letters. Um, and so as I just, to the second paragraph, he says, um, he wrote to Dr. Wright, for so as long as you are continuously with a Nietzsche, as long as you are continuously with impermanence, you are in our midst. As your thought forces are reflected here, you can very well assume that we also feel your presence here. There are three channels of contact, namely by thought, words, and deeds. Contact by words, as in speech or letter, is more forceful than contact by thought. Similarly, contact by deed is more forceful than contact by words. You will feel you would feel this as you were going through the letter. Um, and so I won't stay here. As I said, I and these like this, this exchange is readily it, right now, at least <laughs> available on the web. Like you don't have to wait for me to send a link. It's it's um, on the Pariyati website letters between Dr. Wright and Siaji Ubakini. So over the years, I heard that Goenkaji was one of seven students authorized in the 1960s by Siaji Ubaikin to be Theravada lay um, teachers. However, out of the seven students authorized to teach, Goenkaji is probably the most known 
through his 400 plus Vipassana meditation centers worldwide. Um, so this is a picture of Yang Goinkaji and Siaji Ubakin at the International Meditation Center in Yagon, Myanmar. Um, and so as a result of a, my point of entry was through Goinkaji and just the, the undeniable, um, I don't want to say popularity, just um, but prevalence of the centers. Um, I never in get investigated the other students who studied with Ubagin. In addition to Goinkaji, however, I knew of three of the seven names of the there's seven students that Ubagin appointed to teach outside of Myanmar, and they are um, Robert Hoover on the left, and that's him with um, Siaji Ubagin, Ruth Dennison in the middle, um, and John Coleman. So these are students that he authorized to uh, teach uh, Vipassana meditation. But I never heard of Dr. Wright. And if, so, if by some chance I heard his name, I certainly didn't know he was African-American until Joa told me in 2020. So in fall, <clears throat> what's happening in the system? Okay, sorry. In fall, in fall 2019, I left the Guenca tradition for many reasons, including unaddressed structural racism. Learning about Dr. Wright in the summer of 2020 rocked my spiritual foundation. I learned about him after leaving a tradition that was my spiritual home for 17 years. During the global shutdown resulting from the COVID pandemic that followed the police murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and the subsequent global uprising demanding equity, accountability, and justice for Black people worldwide, I was intrigued and called to make a connection with my brand new African American spiritual ancestor. Again, I asked, how could Dr. Wright and Going to Do not have crossed paths? Housebound, I was ignited to go on an online expedition to learn more about Dr. Wright. Born in 1902, Dr. Wright was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Boston University, where he also received a master's degree in history and philosophy of religion. Subsequently, Wright received a sacred theology degree in 1943 from Harvard Divinity School, and that was with honors. And he went on to complete a PhD in 1945 in the history and philosophy of religion at Harvard University. He then joined Howard University, historically black college university here in Washington, DC faculty in 1945, where he was the associate editor of the university's journal of religious thought from 1950 to 1965. For his brilliant scholarship, he received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1952 and served as the cultural attache at the U.S. Embassy in Yagun, Myanmar from 55 to 57. This image of Dr. Wright that's on the screen is his, on the Guggenheim site. Um, so this is from, this is a young or younger, because if he was born in 1902, he's 50. Um, um, this is a younger um, image of um, Dr. Wright. And unfortunately, I don't have access and they're not on the internet of a lot of images of Dr. Wright. I'm really wanting, I'm sure he had to have taken pictures when he was in Myanmar. <clears throat> so it was during his tenure as an attache, Dr. Wright met Siaji Ubakin and studied extensively with him and Mother Sayamaji. Now Mother Sayamaji is the woman who I referenced in the pictures of, of, of a few pictures back, um, right there. Here she is. This um, so he he studied with both of them, and um, it's it's uh, and for Dr. Wright, he 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 was very um, uh, respectful, I should say, of of their teachings, of both the teachings, because there were some students who didn't want to study with Mother Sayamaji because she was a woman. That was not the case with Dr. Wright. <clears throat> Um, so the book, Knowing a Nietzsche, again, Knowing Impermanence and the Way to Nibbana, that's the Pali word for Nirvana, uh, Awakening, um, by Sayaji 
Uchit Tin, edited by William Pruitt, provides four pages of insight about Dr. Wright's spiritual experiences in Myanmar and his Buddha Dhamma teachings after his return to the US. So um, I just kind of copied, I just t actually typed this out. So in, this is in, uh, from page 173. So when he did Vipassana meditation, Dr. R um, Dr. Wright did very well. At that time, the lower meditation cells were being constructed. So in the um, Ubaqin tradition and Burmese traditions, there are meditation cells for people who meditate a lot of times in at least my understanding insight tradition, having sat two courses last year, there aren't meditation cells. So we're either in the hall or in our rooms, but in, in the Goenka tradition, Ubaqin traditions and many other in, in Burma, excuse me, Myanmar, they are um, cells so that you actually, it's a, a room where you're sitting um, it's a meditation cell. For me, it's one of the most profound experiences. So this is, so at that time, the lower meditation cells were being constructed. They were pouring concrete not five feet away from Dr. Wright's cell, which was on the opposite side of the pagoda from the one in which he worked on Anapana meditation. And when he meditated, he could remain for an hour and a half without hearing the vibrator. Um, of, and that's the vibrator of the concrete. So that was how deep his samadhi, that his concentration was. When Dr. Wright went back to America, he went back to America after, um, and in 63, Ubaikin sent Dr. Wright a letter authorizing him to teach Anapana meditation. He was the first person to be authorized to teach outside of Myanmar. Now Ubaikin authorized others to teach in Myanmar, but he was the first. And this is, these are my words. This is, I just type these words that are in this book just to be really clear. The letter was presented to Dr. Wright in a public ceremony at the Myanmar Embassy in Washington, C, given by the Myanmar ambassador. And Dr. Wright reported that within three years, he preached to 10,000 people, college men and women, and congregational ministers like himself. <laughs> so Sayaji liked to tell the story. This is also in the book just did not have it on this page. He'd like to tell the story of the time the secretary of the Polytext Society of England came to the center in Yagun. When she learned that an American professor of religion who had never studied Pali, never, never studied the writings of the Buddha, um, um, was lecturing on Buddhism. She asked, how was this possible? Siaji told her that Dr. Wright knew the Buddha Dhamma from personal experience. He also remarked that Wright could reach a state of deep reflection, deep samadhi, deep concentration achieved by only one in 10,000 monks. Now I share this information with great respect for the indisputable fact that the historical Buddha was a South Asian man. The first practicing Buddhists were Asian. They were the first people who brought their Buddhist practices and teachings to um, the US and other countries outside of Asia centuries ago. Many overlook this reality that the first sanghas, the first spiritual communities were Asian. Many overlook this reality because those who popularized and in a sense commodified Buddhism in non-Asian communities in the West are white teachers who studied in Asia. I wanna underscore that Siyaji Ubaikin did in 1963 60 years ago, what many white dominant sanghas have tremendous difficulty doing contemporarily, authorizing and appointing black practitioners to teach the Buddha Dhamma. While there are more black Dharma teachers now than there have been, the numbers pale in comparison to the white Dharma teachers. So 2023 marks the 60th year since Dr. Wright's authorization Siaji Ubaikin was way ahead of his time and the curve. And I just wanted to say that 1963 was the same year as the famous March on Washington, the same year that Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, the same year that many, many, many African Americans were disenfranchised from voting. And, and we know that we're still dealing with that now. So just thinking about that, and that Dr. Wright was appointed to teach Anapana meditation. So I believe Dr. Wright and Siyaji Ubaikin shared history is an important 
um, example of a close connection between um, a Burmese meditation teacher and an African American student in the late 50s and 60s. Taking the cultural restrictions into consideration, I find it awe inspiring that Wright, a Black Congregationalist minister, taught Buddhist meditation during the reign of Jim Crow apartheid laws in the United States. Dr. Wright never identified as Buddhist, which is probably why his Buddhism, uh, his legacy in Buddhism remains obscure. He was a Congregationalist minister who taught Buddhist meditation. And here's an image of his book, From Cult to Cosmos, Can Jesus Be Saved? It's out of print. I, um, it, you can still purchase it, but it's astronomical amount of money. I had, uh, I used my American Express points, you know, like the points you use to fly on planes. Well, I used it to get the, the book. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have a copy of the book and it has um, advanced praise from the famous uh, theologian, African-American theologian, um, Howard Thurman, who I believe we'll be hearing about this month from uh, Joy when she gives her talk in a couple of weeks. Um, as a Sufi raised Muslim Buddhist practitioner, I resonate how Dr. Wright's Christian and Buddhist practices worked together. Now through a network of womanist scholars and theologians, I connected with Reverend Dr. Shaw Anderson and Reverend Esther Holloman, doctor um, who um, really opened, embraced me. Um, and again, this is in the height of the shutdown. So this is all like sending emails and trying to find as much as I could because I couldn't go to archives to to find out about Dr. Wright. Um, well, Dr. Anderson's father studied with Dr. Wright at Howard University in the 1970s, and she was generous enough to share her father's syllabus um, from one of Dr. Wright's courses. And Reverend Holloman studied closely with Dr. Wright, and over time, they became chosen family. She eventually called him Uncle Leon. I am grateful for their generosity to share so much with me. Personally, I felt as if Dr. Wright, my new spiritual ancestor, guided my journey to learn more about him and his teachings through his students and chosen family. As a Black Buddhist, I am committed to placing Dr. Leon Wright's name in the continuum of Westerners who studied Buddhist meditation in Asian countries and with authorization from their Asian teachers taught what they learned in their communities back home. Now, I don't have citation for this. I'm committed to finding it, but I learned from Joa and from others about the great, uh, I knew about Ukole, who's a great Buddhist scholar, um, um, and how his relationship with Dr. and Dr. Wright was a chance encounter. So just so people who don't know who Ukole was, and I didn't have a picture of him, was a famous, he was a famous Buddhist scholar who founded the first Myanmar University after gaining independence, and that was in Mandalay. And he became its first vice chancellor. He retired from university service in 1963 and devoted himself entirely to the practice of, of the Pashna meditation and translating the uh, Tipi, um, Tipi, Tipiptika um, Pali Canon, which is really the sacred, one of the sacred texts in Theravada Buddhism. So I, um, and this included, he also gave, uh, translated discourses given by Mahasi Sayadaw on Dhamma. Now for people who just have no idea of what I'm talking about, I wanna just share that the insight tradition um, um, in, 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 in Buddhism, a, a lot of its foundations are on are informed by uh, Mahasi Sayadaw's um, teaching. So the trans so Ukole really played a role in, in in these translations. Now he was Buddhist by birth, as most people born in Myanmar are, and in in his family was going regularly to the uh, in um, the International Meditation Center where Siaji Ubakin taught. But initially he resisted it. He was educated he, and here uh, in, in Myanmar, in the UK and in the United States. And somehow while here in the United States, he heard about this African-American man, Dr. Wright's experiences in Myanmar. And he heard him talk about it at the Myanmar embassy in DC. 
And Ukole was so inspired and ignited, and these are my words, um, by Dr. Wright's experiences, someone who was not Buddhist, not me, um, Burmese, that it, he was ignited to go back to, to, I mean, he went, he wasn't ignited to go back. He went back to his homeland. And, and when he returned home, went to the um, International Meditation Center. I don't have citation for this. This is all kind of oral histories, which is powerful. Like I said, I've heard from several. Um, and I just, to even think, to even imagine, and for those who maybe know that this happened, it's just, it's, it's incredible because when I think about the foundational, I said teachings of insight being in, being informed and guided by Mahasi Sayadaw and thinking about Ukole's translation, translating his discourses and thinking about that initially he was resisting, you know, going to the center, studying with Ubaikin. And then in this circuitous way, Ubaikin through Dr. Wright impacted Ukole. So, I mean, you know, just in terms of just this, this history here. And so my query is, where is the documentation? And I really believe in oral histories, especially as an African descended woman. And we only have to look at what's happening contemporarily with the college board stripping down the advanced placement curriculum for African American studies to understand how powerful the written word is in Western societies. If it weren't, there wouldn't be such an outcry to ban books and censor information that unveils the historical and contemporary realities of race, gender, and sexuality in the United States. While not a direct parallel at all, the inadvertent erasure of Dr. Wright's history also plays a painful role in devaluing his contributions with teaching and or giving lectures on Buddhist meditation. The lack of knowledge and or acknowledgement about him and his profound relationship with Ubaikin skews a narrative about Asian Buddhist teachers and their Western students. Dr. Wright joined the ancestors in 1996. May his memory not only be a blessing, but also a call to uncover hidden figures who traversed uncharted territory in Buddhism. <clears throat> Now I want to give a deep bow to my Dharma kin, Ayo Yatunde, Associate Editor of Lion's Roar, Co-Editor of the 2021 released anthology, Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resiliency, Transformation, and Freedom, and author of the February 7th, that's next Tuesday, released book, Casting Indra's Net, Fostering Spiritual Kinship and Community. It was Io who in fall 2021 encouraged me to write about Dr. Wright for Lion's Roar. And initially I was very hesitant. I was like, who me? Oh no, I'm not a scholar in that way. And she said, this isn't about necessarily a scholarly article. It's about writing about why you have chosen Dr. Wright as your new spiritual ancestor. So fast forward to today, Lion's Roar recently published an article we remember six remarkable Black Buddhists, where Ruth King wrote about Dr. Marlene Jones, Dr. Camilla Majid wrote about Alvin Sykes, Roshi Wendy Ikoyoko Nakao writes about Roshi Merle Koto Boyd, I wrote about Reverend Dr. Leon Wright, Mushim Ikeda wrote about Venerable Bhante Sujita Dharma, and Sister Peace wrote about Leonard West, all Black Buddhist ancestors. This article is available online on, on lionsroar.com. And in her introduction, Ayo writes, the Sankofa is a mythical bird of the Akan people in Ghana. It's depicted with its head turned backward, pointing to the past, while the feet are turned forward, pointing to the future and its body is centered in the now. The symbolism echoes Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching that in the present moment, we teach the past and the future. Paying homage to these Black Buddhist ancestors, we transgress the wave of ignorance and erasure. We embody the Sankofa spirit." Close quotes. 
Thich Nhat Hanh taught that instead of regretting and lamenting the loss of our loved ones, we can contemplate on what aspirations they had and we continue to realize it for them. This is one way we continue, continue them. So in the 60th anniversary year of Dr. Wright's authorization by Sayaji Ubakin, let us remember them both, along with all of the students of Sayaji Ubakin, by continuing to realize their aspirations. And one for me is the remembrance of a Nietzsche, of impermanence, a connection with the breath and remembering that things are constantly changing changing, changing. <clears throat> so I just want to thank you. I'm aware of the time and I'm going to, usually we break out into small groups, but it's 1147 and we do end on time um, to just be out of respect for people's time period. So I want to, um, invite if anyone um, has any questions. Uh, um, I'm looking at the the uh, a quote from Sheila um, Alexander Reed. She says the earlier picture was an amazing shot of Dr. Wright by Addison Scurlock. Scurlock um, was the pinnacle black photographer in DC in the early and mid 20th century. I did not even know this. His pictures are in the Smithsonian and coveted as they document DC black history. He was the James van der Zee, who's the famous black um, photographer during the Harlem Renaissance of DC. So the fact that Dr. Wright was a subject for Scurlock speaks volumes about who he was. So I think, thank you, Sheila. Um, and full disclosure, Sheila is my partner. Um, and I wish I knew that, but we're right now in different cities because I would have incorporated that. So I felt the need to read that, particularly while we are recording. Um, and so I'm going to pause the recording um, to honor, you know, people so they, if any, you know, for folks to be able to speak freely. Um, so let me pause. So yeah, so it's called For All Beings by Zenju. Earthland Manual in African Wisdom. <clears throat> May all beings be cared for and loved, be listened to, understood, acknowledged despite different views, be accepted for who they are in this moment, be allowed to live without fear of having their lives taken away or their bodies violated. May all beings be well in its broadest sense, be fed, be clothed, be treated as if their life is precious, be held in the eyes of each other as family. May all beings be appreciated, though welcomed anywhere on the planet, be freed from acts of hatred and desperation, including war, poverty, slavery, and street crimes. Live upon the planet housed and protected from harm. Be given what is needed to live fully without scarcity. Enjoy life living without fear of one another, be able to speak freely in a voice and mind of undeniable love. May all beings receive and share the gifts of life, be given time to rest, be still and experience silence. May all beings be awake. Thank you.